Tonight, double vaxxed travellers touch down from Sydney. Very happy, happy to be home. It's been a while, but it's good to be back. As the government is ordered to reveal the health advice that triggered lockdown. Also tonight, the federal government takes an unprecedented step denying Christian Porter's referral to the powerful Privileges Committee. Michael's got nothing to say. And an Australian cricket legend arrested and charged with domestic violence offences. Good evening. Tamara O'Dyne with ABC News. On the eve of our last full night in lockdown, there's good news for live music and horse racing fans with key events to go ahead within a fortnight. But just as we prepare to celebrate new freedoms, there's growing pressure on the government to reveal the health advice it's relied on to impose all of these rules. Here's state political reporter Richard Willingham. Oh wow, this is cool. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I come from Sydney. Quarantine-free flights from Sydney have finally touched down, months after the hard border went up. It's a chance for some to reunite with old friends and for others to meet new relatives. We have only seen them on, like... Um, on video calls, haven't we? Yeah, and photos. Super relieved, super excited. It's been stressful, but um, looking much more positive now. It's good. It was very relaxed, which was nice. Didn't feel pressured. Last time we came in, there were lots of questions. Home quarantine for international travel could begin as early as next week, with a trial for vaccinated passengers flying in from London. Make it nine for Novak. But win number 10 at the Australian Open might have to wait for this tennis champion, who refuses to reveal his vaccination status. You'll need to be double vaccinated to visit Australia. That's a universal application, not, not just to tennis players. Live music will finally make its return for 4,000 lucky Melbournians on Saturday week. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard to headline a special music bowl gig alongside Baker Boy and Vicar and Linda Bull. This is a trial to the, test the technology. Um, it's a chance for people to get out. Days later, 10,000 punters will be trackside to cheer on the cup for the first time since 2019. The VRC is hoping authorities will take a bet on Derby Day crowds too. But the rationale behind the state's health orders continues to come under fire, with epidemiologist and a former deputy medical officer questioning Victoria's cautious approach. They need to be subject to a more rigorous analysis and a more rigorous evidence base to say, well, these things might be plausible, but now we've actually got to get some proof that they work or we've got to ditch them. And the public is a step closer to seeing government advice behind lockdowns and public health orders after the information watchdog ruled the Department of Health must release documents relating to February's lockdown. It's a big test of transparency. The department has a little over a week to appeal. You can't just hide behind the line that it's health advice but never make it public. I stand by the, each and every decision this government's made throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we are now in this position where we can start to reopen and we can start to celebrate. Vaccinated hospitality staff will be able to break the last curfew tomorrow to set up for midnight drinkers when the lockdown ends. But for thirsty patrons... Uh, you'll have to wait for the witching hour to, to strike and then you can make your way down to the local pub. I'm sure there'll be some pubs that'll be open. Richard Willingham, ABC News, Melbourne. COVID-19 vaccine booster shots could begin rolling out in aged care within weeks, pending approvals from the medical regulator. The federal government wants boosters going into aged care homes by the second week of November. But the additional jabs have to be approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration and recommended by the government's vaccine advisory body. The health minister expects both those hurdles to be cleared soon and he wants a wider booster program to follow. In terms of the commencement of a general population booster program, um, would I like to see it commence this year and do I expect it to commence this year? Yes and yes. 70% of Australians aged over 16 are now fully vaccinated, a key milestone in the government's reopening plan. Here in Victoria, meanwhile, the latest official figures show we're just shy of that 70% mark and more than 89% of eligible Victorians have had at least one dose. It's been another day of high case numbers, with more than 1,800 infections reported. Sadly, another 12 people have died. 
13 refugees in immigration detention at Melbourne's Park Hotel have tested positive to COVID-19. The first cases at the hotel emerged on Sunday when three men were confirmed as positive. Australian Border Force says another 25 detainees have so far tested negative, while eight are still waiting for their results. All of those diagnosed with the virus are currently being treated at the hotel. Border Force says all detainees in immigration detention have been offered COVID-19 vaccinations and more than half have now received both doses. To the rest of the day's news now and the federal government has taken the unprecedented step of blocking a push to have the former Attorney General Christian Porter investigated over his financial disclosures. That's despite the Speaker ruling there was a case for further scrutiny. Mr Porter quit the front bench last month after declaring a blind trust had covered part of his personal legal fees. Here's political editor Andrew Probin. Christian Porter never hid from the fact his defamation action against the ABC had cost a bomb. My lawyers, whilst they are very good, are very, very expensive. But what does remain hidden is who paid. The former Attorney General's legal costs were partly covered by anonymous donors. It's a blind trust. He cannot disclose to me um, who those donors are. And as such, the Prime Minister last month accepted Mr Porter's resignation from the Ministry, the WAMP stating he was not prepared to seek to break the confidentiality of those people who contributed to his legal fees. The matter arises from an old... But questions about a possible conflict of interest persist. Based on my careful consideration of all of the information available to me, I am satisfied that a prima facie case has been made out. The Speaker of the House, Tony Smith, ruling he'd allow Parliament to debate whether Mr Porter had breached parliamentary rules, something Mr Porter denies. This is a brown paper bag stitched together by lawyers. We have no idea whose money is involved. The government is not going to support uh, the motion that's before the House. And the government got its way. Lock the doors. Blocking Labor's bid to refer Mr Porter to the powerful Privileges Committee. On no occasion would I have even considered rejecting a motion that was brought forward after the Speaker had given due consideration. For the government to effectively spurn the advice of the Speaker, one who says there's a prima facie case to answer, is extraordinary and unprecedented. Not only was it an effective vote of no confidence in the highly regarded Tony Smith, it also tells you the coalition is anxious about its parliamentary numbers. The Privileges Committee may look at Christian Porter's case anyway, but without Parliament's endorsement, its report would remain a secret. Andrew Probin, ABC News, Canberra. The former Premier of New South Wales, Mark Baird, has taken to the witness stand today at a corruption inquiry in Sydney. He said he was incredulous to learn Gladys Berejiklian was in a secret relationship with disgraced MP Daryl Maguire and that she should have told him. Former Premier Mike Baird said he'd come to the corruption inquiry with a heavy heart. I am uh, devastated uh, to be here uh, giving evidence um, given events that have taken place. Uh, Gladys is a close personal friend. He told the hearing his friend had kept him in the dark about her five-year relationship with Daryl Maguire until the ICAC made it public last year. So was that something that came as some um, surprise or that shock to you, finding out that information? I think incredulous. And she also hadn't disclosed it to the Expenditure Review Committee she chaired as Treasurer, even though it was assessing a $5.5 million grant for a gun club in Mr Maguire's electorate in 2016. Certainly, I think it should have been uh, disclosed. Mr Baird believes if it had been, Gladys Berejiklian could have managed the situation. I thought, um, knowing her in terms of integrity and character, uh, that she would be able to manage uh, the conflict. But at the time, the proposal itself was ringing alarm bells for different reasons in Mr Baird's office. In a memo, Mr Baird's Director of Strategy, Nigel Blunden, advised the Premier to oppose the grant. He said he'd argued for the business case to be independently verified before it went to the committee. It was taken off the agenda, but Darrell fired up and Gladys put it back on, he wrote. But this one seemed to keep coming up despite 
our requests being listened to. Gladys and Ayres want it. No doubt they've done a sweetheart deal with Daryl, but this goes against all of the principles of sound economic management. You said that it doesn't sweetheart deal imply something sort of pretty close well. Well, I mean, you could commission it, but I think that's you know, my interpretation of it. My reflection would be that they've supported Dowell's relentless pursuit of this particular project. Mike Baird gave evidence that he hadn't seen Gladys Berejiklian treating Dowell Maguire any differently to other MPs or acting in a biased way. He said despite the concerns raised about the proposal, it still had merit as a regional initiative, especially given the political damage the coalition had suffered a month earlier when it lost the Orange by-election. Sarah Gerrithy, ABC News, Sydney. Former Test cricketer Michael Slater has been charged with domestic violence offences in Sydney. Slater appeared in court after he was arrested at a home in Manly. Police interviewed Slater about an alleged domestic violence incident last Tuesday and charged him with stalking and intimidation, as well as using a carriage service to harass. The 51-year-old didn't make any comments after he was granted conditional bail ahead of his next court appearance in three weeks. Before retiring in 2001, Slater played in 74 test matches and 42 one-day internationals for Australia. A man has been charged with attempted murder after a stabbing attack in Melbourne's inner north earlier this week. 20-year-old Rory McCauley was arrested after he allegedly stabbed two people in a Brunswick shopping centre on Monday. He attended today's hearing from hospital where he's been under police guard. Among the charges are two counts of attempted murder, recklessly causing injury, aggravated assault, a fray and committing an offence while on bail. He did not apply for bail today and will be remanded in custody until the matter returns to court next year. Sydney's gangland war has erupted again. A father and his 18-year-old son have been gunned down on their way to work. Police say it's an atrocious form of retribution in a war over drug turf and they're now worried about reprisals. Mark Reddy reports. It was as brazen as it was similar to two other deadly shootings involving the same notorious family in the past year. Loved ones left in tears again after Salim and Tufik Hamzi were gunned down on their way to work this morning. This is another appalling crime in a long list of gangland-style shootings that have taken place in southwest Sydney. Outside his father's home in Guildford, 18-year-old Salim was shot dead in the front seat of his red ute in broad daylight. His 64-year-old father Tufik copped a bullet to the head in the passenger seat and died in hospital. Neighbours were left in shock. It's not good, it's upsetting, I guess. You know? But the police are on top of it, I hope. It's a bit of a shock, especially because we were here just before. Yeah, so I feel sorry for the family. Only a few streets away, the getaway car was found on fire. Two men were then seen in what police believed to be a grey Ford Mustang speeding off. It started to explode and and pop, um, yeah, very alarming stuff. Yeah, when I saw the fire and like, every fire everywhere, I just tried away. I took uh, the police. Very big uh, smoke everywhere. Strike Force Raptor officers spent the afternoon pulling over drivers in the area, but there were no arrests and no sign of those who pulled the trigger. Police say Salim Hamzi had been on bail for firearm offences when he was killed. Detectives confirmed as part of their inquiries they'll be speaking to rival family the Alamedines, although there's no suggestion they were involved. The gangland feud escalated last October. Almost to the day, Majid Hamzi, the brother of gang leader Bassam Hamzi, was shot dead outside his Condal Park home. And eight months later, cousin Bilal Hamzi was assassinated outside a Japanese restaurant in the city. Investigators believe there could be several killers at large. It's an ongoing issue for us. These retribution-style, drug-turf-style shootings are an ongoing problem. A problem that continues to put innocent lives at risk. Mark Reddy, ABC News, Sydney. Still to come this hour, Dr Norman Swan explains why many of us could soon be queuing up for a third COVID jab. As vaccines become uh, available uh, towards the end of uh, this year, it is absolutely critical uh, that those whose immunity may be waning are afforded that third dose uh, availability. It's important to remember that double-dose vaccination gives good protection. 
And for most of us, we've plenty of time before we'll need a third dose. Plus, comedian Celeste Barber talks about the weirder trappings of fame. That's coming up. A plane carrying 21 passengers and crew has crashed and burst into flames near Houston, Texas. The plane rolled through a fence and caught fire during takeoff from the Houston Executive Airport. Amazingly, everyone made it off the plane safely before firefighters moved in to extinguish the blaze. The National Transportation Safety Board has sent a team of investigators to the scene. A US congressional committee has agreed to recommend criminal charges against former Donald Trump adviser Steve Bannon. Mr Bannon is refusing to testify before the panel investigating the January 6 Capitol riot. The committee says it will not tolerate defiance of its subpoenas and voted unanimously to hold Mr Bannon in contempt of Congress. If the full house backs the move, it'll be up to the Department of Justice to decide whether to pursue criminal charges. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has set out his vision for a green revolution ahead of crucial UN climate talks in Glasgow later this month. His plan to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 includes an investment of almost $2 billion on electric cars and support for the automotive industry. At an investment summit in London, Mr Johnson called on private financiers to back green technology. We must bring in the private sector because I can I can deploy billions with the approval of the Chancellor, obviously. But you, you in this room, you can deploy trillions. He says the UK has already secured $18 billion of foreign investment for sustainable energy projects. The Morrison government is no closer to a deal on climate policy, with the negotiations between the Liberal and National parties still dragging on. But even though more than 100 countries have committed to net zero emissions by 2050, a new UN report on fossil fuels shows that not much is being done to reach those targets. Michael Slezak explains. These are the emissions from fossil fuel production in 2019 about 35 gigatons. Despite all the talk of emissions reductions, that number is set to grow all the way to 2040 and beyond. That's a problem because if we want to keep warming at 1.5 degrees, it's more than twice what we're allowed to produce. That difference is what the UN calls the production gap, the basis of its latest report. We need to get rid of fossil fuels. It's not even in line with two degrees warming. For that, we'd need to cut fossil fuel production by 45%. Countries have made pledges to reduce emissions. This is what those pledges would require. The problem is, even that isn't anywhere near enough. That is really inconsistent with our interests to avoid more wildfires and floods and droughts and everything else that comes with um, climate change. According to the UN, countries are throwing taxpayer money at increasing their fossil fuel production instead of reining it in. Since the start of the pandemic, G20 governments have spent 300 billion US dollars subsidising fossil fuel production, more than what they've spent on clean energy. Australia is the world's sixth biggest fossil fuel producer and we're the world's largest coal exporter and second largest LNG exporter. And our taxes are being used to accelerate that. The report notes Australia's commitment to a gas-fired recovery. Once we stop these, all these subsidies, then the energy transition will be even much, much quicker. What to do about it? Well, the report says the answer is clear. Governments need to wind down the production of coal, oil and gas and the coming climate conference in Glasgow is the place to do it. Michael Slezak, ABC News. As that UN climate change conference approaches, companies as well as governments are facing scrutiny over carbon emissions. The buildings we use and live in are also a major source of emissions. Commercial spaces and homes that are greener cost less to run and sell for more, prompting calls for a mandatory rating system. Australia's largest supplier of building products is changing the way it makes concrete. Every gram of cement we take out, we reduce the CO2 content. Carbon dioxide is released when the materials used to make cement, including limestone, are heated in a kiln. That production process accounts for around 7% of global emissions. So companies like Borrell are developing alternatives. If you think about road infrastructure, there are a couple of state governments that are specifying low carbon concrete. 
Using lower emissions materials can help a building earn green credentials. The industry-led Green Building Council is expanding its rating system from commercial properties to new homes. The biggest asset in your entire life, your house, we don't have a national disclosure system for that in Australia. Changes to the National Construction Code will be introduced next year, plus a scorecard to assess the energy efficiency of existing homes. But it's voluntary. Beyond environmental concerns, there are also financial reasons homeowners may consider opting in. Research has found properties with features like solar panels or grey water systems are worth more. They're actually being sold at a much higher price compared to the median price for the suburb and also quicker as well. Jason York has seen rising demand for the insulation he installs as homeowners go green. But he warns a box ticked stating a house is insulated is no guarantee it actually works. Thermal properties are only going to go so far until we change the building standards. A message from the front line of building. Stephanie Chalmers, ABC News. BHP has offered an unqualified apology to employees who've been sexually harassed or assaulted at work. The mining industry has been dogged by allegations of unacceptable and criminal behaviour and is under increasing pressure to improve the treatment of women in its workforce. Eliza Borello reports. The Big Australian has issued a big apology. I wanted to take this opportunity um, to apologise to each and every person that's been impacted by sexual assault or sexual harassment in, in any way in our business. Appearing before a West Australian parliamentary inquiry, the admissions were also big. Unacceptable behaviour still occurs. And so long as it does, we must and will do more. In the past two years, multiple allegations of sexual assault have been reported by BHP employees and contractors. It sacked almost 50 staff over inappropriate conduct and the industry as a whole is considering setting up a register so perpetrators can't move between companies. We have initiated a trial which we're running in our iron ore operations um, to be able to do criminal background checks on every single person who uh, we in the process of recruiting. WA's mining lobby fears the spectre of harassment is damaging female recruitment drives. What young impressionable girl would want to work on a mine site thinking she's going to be sexually harassed or assaulted? I've had 17 years as a female in this industry and it's been an incredible industry. Um, for me and I want more women to have that opportunity and that means we need to do everything we can to make sure that they're safe. BHP has also defended its policy of searching employees rooms if it's suspected they're storing more than the allowed four standard drinks. Eliza Borello, ABC News. To finance now and the local share market produced a solid gain today with retailers and banks up the most. Here's Alan Kohler. Well, after rising throughout September, market volatility is now falling. And for the month of October so far, the All Ordinaries is up 3%, including today's half a percent. And today was all about the banks and retailers, especially the online retailer Kogan, up 7% on news of a big surge in quarterly sales and a 30% lift in active customers. Flight Centre, on the other hand, did not fly. Global markets were generally higher today after a 0.7% rise in New York last night. Iron ore and oil went up on commodity markets while copper and zinc went down. And the Australian dollar briefly touched 75 US cents today for the first time since July and is currently just below that. But the currency against which the Aussie is really flying at the moment is the Japanese yen. It's up more than 6% this month to its highest rate in three years. Foreign exchange traders are dumping the yen because of the global energy crisis that's pushing up the cost of Japan's imported oil and gas. And here's the main reason there are global shortages of everything at the moment, including energy. The world champion consumers, Americans, are buying more stuff than they ever have before, with stimulus checks from the government. Supply chains are clogged. Paul Krugman in the New York Times says it's just like when there's too many cars trying to use the same road. It's a traffic jam. Oh, and Facebook is apparently going to change its name next week. Send your suggestions to mzuckerberg at fb.com. I'm suggesting they go green. Faceplant. And that's finance. Very good, Alan. 
The relationship between Australian basketball star Ben Simmons and the Philadelphia 76ers continues to deteriorate, with the NBA team suspending him for detrimental conduct. Simmons is agitating to leave the franchise, and the Sixers are growing impatient with his half-hearted preparation for the new season. After refusing to play in pre-season games, Ben Simmons was back at training this week but appeared disengaged. And it's the talk of the NBA. His cameras even caught what looked like his cell phone visible in his pocket. Come on, <coughs> just grow up and, and be a pro. Is he wrong? You're damn right he's wrong. On the eve of the season, the Philadelphia 76ers coach dismissed Simmons from training and banned him for one game. It was a distraction today. Uh, I didn't think he wanted to do uh, what everybody else was doing. We told him to go home. The talented 25-year-old was heavily criticised after a poor performance during last season's playoffs. Ben Simmons, you got to shoot that shot. He withdrew from the Olympics to work on deficiencies in his game, but has been losing millions of dollars for missing training sessions and games. Clearly, Ben Simmons continues to try to push Philadelphia to find a trade for him. While the 76ers coach says he wants Simmons to stay, some teammates are less enthusiastic. At the end of the day, our job is not to babysit somebody. It's not all lukewarm for Australians in the NBA. Patty Mills is scorching hot. Good day, mate. In his first game for new team, the Brooklyn Nets, Patty Mills hit seven three-pointers from as many attempts in the season opener. This is how he plays in the Olympics. His shooting was exceptional, but, you know, more so just the, the energy, the IQ, the experience. 21 points from the Boomers' captain wasn't enough as the Nets lost to the reigning champions, the Milwaukee Bucks. Duncan Huntsdale, ABC News. The Adelaide Strikers have made it two wins from two starts in the Women's Big Bash League, cruising to victory over the Melbourne Renegades in Tasmania. Sarah Coit stormed through the Renegades' batting lineup with three wickets, restricting Melbourne to a total of six for 126. In reply, Talia McGrath continued her stellar form with the bat, knocking an unbeaten half century. Gets there on the full this time and finds the gap. Pinpoint precision from McGrath on that offside again for yet another boundary. Look at the strike rate she is going at right now. As Adelaide secured the victory with two overs to spare, the Renegades were left to deal with a potentially serious knee injury to all-rounder Georgia Wareham. Now with the weather, here's Paul Higgins. And Tam, what a beautiful day it turned out to be today. It was sunny right from the start here in Melbourne. We didn't get that cloud that was expected and barely a ripple at the northern end of the bay. There's something very relaxing about that photo. Not sure what it is. But it was cool overnight, although the sky where the skies were clear, rather glen coldest out of the mountains with two degrees. Most of the state shared today's sunshine, but not so out in Gippsland where some isolated showers fell with up to five millimetres of rain falling in spots. Mildura was top of the ladder again on 28 degrees. 23 Melbourne's city high, that came at 5.36 p.m. with a bit of a sea breeze around Bayside, keeping it cooler than the suburbs inland. And right now outside the back door, it is still 21. Very dangerous thunderstorms in Queensland have produced some giant hail with one hailstone, not necessarily one of these, even though they are big, but one hailstone has been acknowledged by the Bureau as a record size for Australia, about 16 centimetres across. More severe storms were active in the Mackay area today. In Darwin, it stayed above 29 degrees all night and felt like 34 with 80% humidity. And that 29 is a record for an October night in Darwin. Meantime, Perth is recovering from a strong cold front that whipped the city late yesterday. Now, most of that severe weather has slipped away to the south or is weakening. A weak trough will be in western Victoria tomorrow night. And then on Friday, a cold front will team up with it to bring some showers, mostly across southern and mountain parts, but it will tend to rain over central areas on Friday night. You can see it thickening up there. Tomorrow, Perth, Sydney and Canberra will have a shower or two. Thunderstorms in Brisbane, dry in Hobart and Adelaide. We'll Back home, brief showers in our west early tomorrow with an upper level disturbance, and then some showers late in the day in the southwest. Cloud will increase from the west as the day goes on, up to 32 in the Mallee tomorrow, and into the 20s across the rest of the board. Some patchy morning fog in Gippsland. On the bay and north to northeasterly, 15 to 25 knots, and strong winds tomorrow on all coastal waters. 
Well, down to 14 under a full moon in Melbourne tonight, 24 tomorrow. We'll have some mid and high level cloud around, but there won't be any rain with it, and a fresh north to northeast wind. On Friday, showers increasing to rain in the afternoon and especially the evening, 24 before an early afternoon cool change. Saturday, early rain easing to a few showers, a cool southwesterly wind, and 16. Sunday, a shower or two, that southwesterly breeze will keep it cool, 16. Monday, a shower or two, and then warming up, 20 on Tuesday, 20 next Wednesday, Tam. Thanks, Paul. And that's it for this evening's Bulletin. Lee Sales is up next with 7.30.